Let's see. Hi, everyone. I'm Erica, and I'm going to talk uh, in a very briefly here about ethics and mapping ethical geography. So um, I was a fellow for the AGS, American Geographical Society in Ethical Geo this year, and I've been trying to work towards some principles for mapping with vulnerable communities as my as my project. So this is just a very quick dive into it, um, what's come up, and I haven't really even presented this yet. Um, so I'm really welcoming feedback and comments and so forth. So um, while I mostly work internationally, especially with Map Kibera in Kenya, and that's what you may know me from, I think this also applies in the US with groups that may not live in something like an informal settlement, but they um, live in historically disenfranchised areas. Um, also, of course, those who are mapping in the US, uh, mapping other parts of the globe from here. Um, so as far as vulnerable, the, the I don't love the term, but if anyone has a better term, I'd be happy to hear it, but is a definition. Um, I'm looking at vulnerable as susceptible to different kinds of impacts, economic impacts, um, man-made or natural hazards. Um, the types of places I'm thinking of are informal settlements and slums, which is what I'm the most familiar with, um, but also like refugee camps and areas with migrants, uh, rural and remote areas that might just be particularly vulnerable. Um, and those particularly affected by natural disaster and climate change, for instance, above all those who aren't easily or typically able to influence decision making that affects their everyday lives. So in order to go about this, I did talk to, I did some interviews and I, um, unfortunately COVID kind of prevented some of the work that we were going to do. Oh, let me see if we go back. And so I started out looking at some frameworks that exist for ethical work in primarily data, responsible data is sort of a whole movement. A lot of organizations have responsible data codes. Um, there's also a really interesting set of materials for PGIS, participatory GIS, um, open data. There's some frameworks and codes and indigenous data work. So let's see. So if you are thinking about mapping in an informal settlement, let's just say, um, what is sort of the most which you maybe should have in your mind ahead of going in and working in this area. And of course, I'm speaking about this from my own perspective and per perhaps the US uh, Connect attendees were primarily American and probably not um, residents of such, such an environment. Um, so in 1979, there was a report that came out called the Belmont Report for Human Subject Research. And what I found was these responsible data frameworks um, that are currently um, happening a lot around technology can still really draw from those same um, concepts that came out in 1979 around human subjects. So um, the first category of those would be uh, respect and in the Belmont report, which of course is for a researcher um, with individuals, consent and privacy are first and foremost. So that report first sort of established this idea that you need to get consent and that consent needs to be informed and ought, um, sort of there needs to be autonomy in selecting. So in terms of geo and especially now this ethical geo framework is not particularly OSM centric, but um, that's my background. And so when it comes to open data and geo, consent might be something that you find hard to understand like how can we possibly ask these group of people you know is it okay to map here do you want to participate in the mapping um, privacy i think of in this case more around like remote sensing and drones not necessarily individual privately identifiable information but how do we consider privacy in the new technology age given that i don't have a lot of time i'm just going to be tossing these things out <laughs> Um, as far as benefit, that's the second category that comes up from that uh, pre-existing framework and basically about what are the risks and benefits to mapping the area that you're going to map. Um, are there any risks to people? How do you know what they are? Um, do people know what the risks might be? How do you explain what the mapping project is going to bring in terms of benefits? Um, how do you uh, ev avoid extracting data? So bringing data back, bringing the maps back. That's what this photo is kind of about. And duplication, avoiding re-surveying, remapping. Um, OSM is of course a perfect vehicle for avoiding duplication of research and data. Um, and the third category being justice. In the research framework, 
this has to do with opportunity distribution and not sort of harming one sector of the population while helping another sector in a vulnerable community, I kind of re twist it and turned it a little bit to be a little more about providing equal opportunities. If you are having participation, who are you asking to participate? How are you um, increasing capacity? How are you looking at the distribution of benefits and um, even just the distribution of maps or data opportunities? So I think we need to be more self-critical about which sectors of society are standing to benefit from our maps and from OSM. And in particularly in this, these more vulnerable communities where um, it's really on the those who are developing projects or who are mapping to to start to think more critically about this. Um, so is OSM purely a technical project? No, it's not. To me, it's always been a social project as well with a kind of social impact potential. Um, so I think that I might be out of time. So <laughs> this was very lightning. Um, please, please reach out and I look forward to talking more about all of these topics.